it said shortly, but we're going to start now because it started over again. And it said, it, and I had to wait to come up here because it said prepare, and then I couldn't remember if I had silenced my phone or not. So I went to that first real quick. Got to stay on top of it. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. I like the fact that the light is shining off of a windshield into my eyes because that tells me the sun is out and it's going to be a beautiful day. Uh, well, we got some things coming up. Uh, this coming Saturday, March 4th, men's breakfast, 9 a.m. right here in, well, it'll become a dining room. We'll change it from a sanctuary to a dining room this week and uh, we'll have that meal together. Uh, in addition to our normal uh, men's breakfast, Fair, we will also be having pancakes and Mark planned ahead for those of you that can't have a lot of sugar we've got regular and sugar-free syrup and all I can remember I told Mark was the sugar-free syrup from Boy Scout camp back in the mid 80s and it was <laughs> there's no words to describe how bad that was but he tells me it's really really good so I'm gonna have to try it since I'm diabetic Less desirable, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's being nice. Less than desirable. But we're looking forward to that. So if you're coming, please uh, RSVP us so we know that you're coming, so we know uh, how much food we need to have here. Uh, with that, then the, uh, right after that, well, actually, this starts now. Mm -hmm. So in the footsteps of the Savior, this is our sermon series for uh, six weeks. And we're going to be covering up several pieces that forgot the book because I was going to sneak a peek at it um, for the titles for the rest of it. But today is uh, we're going to be talking about doubt. When you doubt, um, following Jesus, when you doubt, how do you do that? Well, it's pretty easy. Mark's going to cover quite a bit of that today, so look forward to that. Um, if you're watching online. Uh, there'll be a link going up that has uh, a link right to the Footsteps of the Savior page on our website. Uh, the top of the page is about the sermon series, which starts today. And then the next thing is the Bible study. And included with that Bible study piece in there, there's also a, uh, I think it's about a minute 18 uh, trailer, where we hear directly from Max about what the Bible study is about. The really neat thing is he's going to be traveling around the Holy Land as he does these teachings. So uh, this Wednesday we'll be watching the video that he did in Capernaum, which will be really cool. Now Mark and I were talking about this one just this morning. Um, we've got it kind of sort of narrowed down. Um, we've, we're looking at different ways of licensing it that will save us uh, a lot of money this year. And there's a lot of great videos out there, out there, including one that's in the theaters that we can't quite watch because it's still in the theaters. And that's Jesus Revolution, which I know you all went oh, yeah. and had your date night. Um, another pastor friend of mine, Ty, he and his wife had a date night as well and basically said pretty much the exact same thing. Got to see it. Absolutely. So uh, got to see it tells me we got to show it. So eventually that will be coming, not in March. Um, then we've got some other things coming up here. We've got racing that's coming up March 11th. That'll be a second race of our 18th season. Uh, for more information about that, orangetrackracing.org. And uh, Danny was telling me this morning he found a bunch of cars at uh, the Dollar and a Quarter Tree. <laughs> I know they haven't officially changed the name, but Denny has changed it for them. And so that's what we're going by. Uh, then coming up April 1st, not, this is not a joke, this is real, this is our Iron Sharpens Irons men's conference that we're going to be going to in Davenport. Um, very much looking forward to this for different reasons. Uh, number one, I love worshiping with other guys, there's just something about doing that. Number two, they're going to have some great main speakers in Stephen Kendrick and Joe Martin. And then there's going to be breakout seminars in both the morning and the afternoon, and those breakout seminars we get to choose the ones that we go to, and the ones that we feel are, that God is calling us to, that we can hear from. So we're looking forward to that conference. Um, 
Other than that, the playlist for today's worship music will be coming into the uh, the live feed there, so that kind of when the service is over, those that you're watching online can then watch those videos with us. It's important um, to watch those because Mark and I, when we are putting that together, that is almost as taxing as creating the ser or doing the sermon itself because we tie that music into the message. All right. Now, it's, as the video said a little bit ago on the countdown, it's time to slow down, take a deep breath, and, and prepare our hearts and prepare uh, things for us. And Mark has up here a prayer, and it says, Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. As I read that, all I can see are the countless videos, not just of, and I've talked about Asbury, it's going across campuses, it's going across the world that people are coming to it. In fact, there's a campus in Texas where the administration would not let them go into the chapel, so what they do, they did it right out on the yard. So, it's about our faith and when things are going on and how things can happen when we doubt. Now, this morning, uh, Pastor Mark's going to be talking about following Jesus even when we doubt. And the call to worship scripture that was chosen by Pastor Mark this morning comes from Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And in this passage, it's Jesus heals on the Sabbath is the, the title of this section. And it says, Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, Come and stand in front of everyone. Well, that's not pressure on that guy at all. <laughs> Come stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. They were so darn jealous. It, it's, it's crazy how, it, it, and it wasn't just of, of his popularity. They were jealous of the fact that he did miracles. They were jealous of the fact that when he spoke, when he read from the scriptures, or when he taught from the scriptures, he did it with such authority, they felt challenged. They felt, they felt small compared to him. And that was a very much a threat because their status in the community was, that was all about, that's what they were all about. Status and what could they get out of it? We hear a lot of churches, you know, the big churches where, pastors driving these fancy cars and might have a plane or two and Mark and I actually had a discussion with someone this week that that was a put off and we said hey not here we don't take we put in two and that would be a challenge to their authority as well the problem is it's just like the churches today they had lost sight of what they were to do they were so inwardly focused that they completely missed who Jesus said he was and who he is. If they had listened to the scriptures as they should have, they would have seen. It's that deductive reasoning. You see this, and this is the outcome. They've missed it altogether. And that happens yet today. We see it all the time. People doubt everything that we say because they're so ingrained into what they believe that even if the truth 
slapped them up alongside the head. It's a little harsh, but you get the idea. They still wouldn't believe it. They would argue their moot point to the end. Yeah, Jesus got angry with them. But it was a righteous anger. It was an anger that he did something to change what was happening instead of what the Pharisees did. Because you heard what they did at the end there? They went away to meet with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. That in and of itself was also breaking their own law. They were working on the Sabbath. And then they were plotting to kill, which is against the commandments that they taught. So how do we follow Jesus when we doubt? I got all kinds of things I could say, but I would cut way into Mark's time this morning and what he's already prepared. And I know Mark. I know what he does when he plans and prepares. And it's going to be good. So let's prepare our hearts. Father God, prepare our hearts to hear the words that you've given to Mark this morning on what it means to follow your son when we doubt, when we are clouded by the world, when the things of the world get in the way and we lose sight of who you are, what your son did for us. When we're constantly bombarded, Lord, by the actions and words of this world, Father, let us see through that with your eyes so that even when we do doubt, because doubting isn't a bad thing, it causes us to go and read and learn more. But help us. As the scripture said, the father who had asked for healing for their child said, help me in my unbelief. Help us in our doubt, Father. morning church how's everybody today Good it's awesome thank you for joining us online as well as in person here today and uh, you know I think this is something that uh, we struggle with how do we follow Jesus when we doubt and uh, it's it's kind of a, a, a struggle to, to kind of wrap your arms around and, and get a hold of but we all face it at some point in time and as we're going to learn today, doubt ne is not necessarily a bad thing, but it is if we dwell on it. So our call to worship today, the reason I picked this, and you're kind of going, well, what does that have to do with what we're actually talking about? But see, we're, we're starting on a six-week journey, and this journey then is going to take us on six weeks to go on Jesus' journey to the cross. And so as we go through our daily lives, we're faced with things that kind of, you know, challenge us on a regular basis, things we have to overcome, things we have to face. And Jesus, one of the biggest things he had to face were the people who were supposedly the heads of the church, the leaders of the synagogue, the Pharisees that were there, and the Sadducees, which was another group that he had to deal with along the way. But the thing about it is, if we take a look at this and we're, we're looking at Jesus, he's coming to do his ministry on earth, and he's doing something for someone who has a need, and he's fulfilling that need. Now, the priests of the day, they just walk on by, he's unclean, we don't want to have anything to do with him because he's deformed. So at some point in time in, in his life or in his parents' life, someone sinned against God, and so that's what happened is he became deformed. But Jesus looks at him and he says, no, no, no. He says, we're here for these people, not to be against these people. And the people were so focused on what the old Jewish law was. And they had over 600 different laws that they had to obey at any given point in time. Now compare that to what we have in our world today. This was just religious laws, but you know, you think about what we have to face today 
You know, I used to be a, a deputy sheriff, so I had to learn the compendium of Iowa, which is, you know, the laws of the state of Iowa. So we study all kinds of laws. Well, the traffic section is, is section 321 dot whatever of the law. Then it gives us all the motor vehicle lo laws and everything else that go along with it. And, you know, to try and remember, because when you're writing someone a ticket, you have to write the exact code that they violated down to the 321.462 or whatever it happens to be, uh, depending upon what they did. And so the, these givers of the law would stand and wait for someone to violate it so they could come against them. So Jesus' example here is we're not supposed to be coming against the people. We're supposed to be giving them that hand up. We're supposed to be helping these people out. That's what God wants us to do. Come alongside of those who are struggling with something in their life. Come alongside of them, edify them, lift them up, and bring them into community with other believers. That's what they're supposed to be doing. But instead, they would condemn them under the law, find some reason to make them unclean, and cast them out. And Jesus was there trying to unify the people again to bring them into community. So his struggles and the things that he had is he had all of these Jewish leaders of the church who doubted who he was and wouldn't recognize him and his authority for being the Son of God. And so that's kind of what I wanted to set that frame for is that even Jesus faced doubt. Even Jesus had doubters against him. He had things that he had to overcome on his journey to the cross. And so during the, this time that we're going to go through, we're, we're starting off in this six sessions in the life of Jesus. And it's a view into the life and the character of Jesus, who he was and what he did and why he did what he did. And it was really to bring a change, a revolution, if you want to borrow from that movie title that we saw Friday. You guys got to see it. I was so lifted up by that movie, it was just awesome. Uh, take Kleenex, so. <laughs> uh, so during this Lenten season that we have, the, the six weeks prior, the 40 days prior to um, Easter, then it's a time for us then to kind of go back and reflect on our own lives, what we're doing in our lives, what we've done in our lives, and to see, you know, are we following? Jesus. And the first week of the Lenten season that began this last Wednesday, unfortunately we got iced out on that one. Ash Wednesday begins that journey that we're going to take. And it's a personal introspective on the life of Jesus and his teachings. It's also a time for us to take a look at our own lives. Where are we in our walk with Jesus? It's a 40-day period where we honor Christ by calling ourselves to deny ourselves in some way to bring honor to what Jesus gave up for us. Now, during this period, it also reflects on his time that he went out and fasted for 40 days in the desert. And so we want to make sure that we are in tune with what Jesus did on his journey to the cross. So by observing those 40 days of the Lent, we as Christians then can replicate Jesus' sacrifice and the withdrawal into the desert where he fasted for those 40 days. Now the thing about it is, in, in the modern church times, Lent wasn't a thing until 325 AD. That's when Lent actually started and the traditions of the church started. So 325 years went by after Christ passed that they finally, the church finally put this into play to get the people to understand what went on. And Lent uh, is treated differently by a lot of denominations out here. And so I was in there and, and I was perplexing my, my hairstylist this week. So. <laughs> She had to spend some time trying to figure out which hair to cut. And so, you know, it takes a while and she gets confused at times, but you know, it, it's a process and it's a choice. So, 
But when we were talking, and she is a very uh, religious person herself, and she said that they kind of bounce back and forth in their church family. They, they bounce back between Veritas and Antioch Church and things like that. So her question to me as she's cutting the hair, she goes, do you do ashes? And I went, um, what do you mean? <laughs> and she says, well, do you do ashes? Because, you know, we, we were kind of looking for a church to go to so that we could do the ashes. You know, you're supposed to do the ashes for Ash Wednesday. I said, well, sure. I said, yes, we do, as a matter of fact. She goes, well, Veritas and Antioch, they don't do ashes. And they're more contemporary. Now, what does that mean? So, is it that they as a congregation or as, or, or as a church decided that, yeah, this is too old school for them and they want to be more contemporary, they want to appeal to a, a, a generation, so let's just forget about the Lenten season altogether. Let's forget about Ash Wednesday. And so in doing so, you lose the meaning of the entire season. And so as I got to thinking, as I was writing this, I said, well, Lent is a mystery to a lot of people. Many folks are generally aware that it's, you know, some kind of religious observance that happens every spring and somehow involves people getting ashes smeared on their foreheads and or giving up chocolate or alcohol or Facebook until Easter. And pretty much that's all they know about it. They don't know any of the rest of it. They don't know the meaning of what Lent is all about. And so many other people ask others what they're giving up for Lent. They don't know why, but it's just a tradition. Hey, it's that time of year, so what'd you give up for Lent? And I said, well, why are you giving up anything for Lent? Do you know what it's about? Do you know why we smear the ashes? Why we, why we do that on the head? It's not just a smear, it's a sign of the cross. But we do that for a reason. Lent is the greatest and most solemn period of fasting on the church calendar for Christians. And it leads up to the celebration of Christianity's greatest feast day. Do you know that Easter was a feast day for the church? Easter marks the day when Christians celebrate Jesus' resurrection and his triumph over death. And if we were observing Lent properly then we would be on a fast of some sort. We are to give up something, which like Christ did when he went for 40 days in the desert, we give up something for 40 days. He fasted for 40 days in the desert. And quite a number of churches celebrate Easter by having a breakfast or a communal meal together to commemorate the body of Christ that is gathered together, the church, at the breaking of the fast. So that is our church breakfast that we have. And that's where we get the term breakfast. So here's kind of a fun thing is Lenten practices are why we have Easter eggs. Did you know that? It's because of Lent. The faithful would abstain from eggs and dairy during Lent, but in the days before refrigeration, the dairy would spoil. So eggs, however, would keep for a longer period of time if you don't wash them after they're laid, those eggs will stay for months. They would keep good and stay good and they would store up all these eggs and then they would cook them for the communal meal at the breaking of the fast. So that's where breakfast comes from. And Lent as itself, as a practice by the church, is designed to dismantle our self-centered ideas that we kind of tend to build ourselves up through our life. And so we want to get away from the self-centeredness of our lives and we want to join in together to help others and join in as a communal to identify the places in our life where we've grown arrogant or complacent. To remember that we're all going to die someday. It's a somber time. We know that we are on our journey to the end as well. And it's meant to end our grateful celebration of life that we've been given and the promise then of an everlasting life with Christ. 
See, that's what that time is meant for. So it's, a, it's kind of a somber time for us. We need to be introspective. We need to reflect on who we are, where we are in our walk with Christ, and are we doing what Christ is calling us to do? We all have been called in one way or another. See, and that brings us where we are today. Reflecting on our, our journey with Christ. Now we're going to be following Max Lucado as he guides us through some of the thinking points in our Lenten study in the footsteps of the Savior. So we're to walk with Christ as we go through this study. In the call to worship today, we looked at what Jesus had to endure on his journey to the cross. Those who were threatened by Jesus and his works were always looking for a way to trap him into violating Jewish law and therefore publicly discredit him. They, he threatened their very way of lives. See, they were lavished with a lot of gifts. They were lavished. And they had kind of some schemes going on. And that's why Jesus, when he came into the, to the temple where they were selling all the, the animals for sacrifice at the temple, the problem was is that the people selling that were giving a kickback to the people, the Pharisees, the high priests and the prophets. And they would come in and say, well, this is a blemish dove. You need to bring one that's unblemished. And they'd have to go out and buy another one to bring it in for the sacrifice. And so they, they were not doing what God wanted them to do, but it was for their own gain. So in doing this and in going through all these things, it would bring the doubts of the minds as Jews who Jesus was and why he was there. In the weeks ahead, we're going to explore these with Max Locato as we journey in the footsteps of Jesus. And we, we think about that, and as I was preparing this, I was reading in, in the book of Mark, and we were talking about in there where Jesus went back to preach in his own town. And he was preaching with authority, and people were really energized, and they're going, hey, now wait a minute, wait a minute, that's the kid that I watched growing up. He was the carpenter's kid, and... And, you know, here's his brothers and here's his sisters over here. And he's nobody special. And they discounted him. And they discounted him. And so even in some of those times when he is proving himself out and proving the gift that God has given him to bring to the people, they turn away in doubt. They turn away in doubt. So in a recent conversation that we had in here, uh, well, someone who was unchurched, they, they were talking about, well, you know, I just have so many doubts about these things. I, I just have no idea what's real, so I have a hard time trying to accept anything about Christianity. And so I said, well, you know, while it's healthy to have some doubts, it's not a good place to dwell in. And that's one of my major points I want to talk about today. Uh, I responded that, that it was good to have doubts because it makes us curious and we will pursue finding the truth, which is one of the reasons we have the opportunity to doubt. We have that opportunity to be curious about things. God wants us to. He wants us to dig into the word, to get to the truth. Because in the process of that, you ever read the Bible and you're reading along and you go, aha, this is what I wanted. But in the process of doing that, you get like four other light bulbs that turn on and you go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I happened to me several times when I was reading this, I was going, well, this is really what it's all about. So I know that some people out there, and I've, I've witnessed it many, many times, you know, they, they, it's, it's a good thing to doubt and you want to try and find the truth but you don't want to stall out in the lane, if you know what I mean. You want to seek the information that you need and you want to keep on moving. But there's a lot of people who stall out in the doubt process and they kind of dwell there. And when that happens, faith wanes, frustration sets in, which left unchecked then leads to anger and darkness in their lives. It's not a good place to be in or to stay in. So when you have doubt, you need to go find the answers and move on. Find the truth that you're looking for. 
Today we're, we're looking at how faith can dispel that doubt. How it can keep us from dwelling in that place and, and getting into the darkness and the anger and everything that comes with it. So as we join our study with Maxwell Cato uh, today, he's in Capernaum, which is located at the very north end of the Sea of Galilee. And he takes us into that book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. And he tells us the use of the miracles that happened as he journeyed through that region in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a major trade zone. It was a little tiny town. It wasn't all that big. But it was a major trade zone right there for people to come through, right at the tip of the Sea of Galilee. And so when we go into uh, Mark in here, it kind of sets the scene. And what I like, uh, if you join us on Wednesday, which I hope you will, we're going to see that Sea of Galilee in the background as Max is talking about the study and going through that study. And it's really interesting to be able to see and experience at the same time you're reading the passages. So in your mind's eye right now, what you have to do is you gotta think there's a sea behind me, okay? I know it's a wall, but there's a sea behind me. So Jesus got into the boat again and went to the other side of the lake where a large crowd was gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, fervently pleading with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and all the people followed crowding around him. Now a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, well, if I can just touch his robe, I can be healed. And immediately stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed from her terrible condition now Jesus who was walking through this whole crowd of people and if you can imagine what that's like he was probably brushing up against a lot of people as they were trying to move through people hurrying around him and, and just wanting to be close to him but he realized at once that the healing power had gone out of him. And so he turned around in the midst of this crowd and asked, who touched my robe? And his disciples, being practical as they are, well, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Imagine what that was like for Jesus. He, he felt that power go out of him. And he had to address that woman. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what happened to her, came and fell at his feet and told him what she had done. I thought if I could just touch your robe that I could be healed. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. It's all done. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when he came to the home of the synagogue leader of Jairus' home, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing, and he went in inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. 
And as you can imagine, the crowd laughed at him. So he made everyone leave, and he took the girl's mother and father and his three disciples and went in where the girl was lying. And he picked up her hand and held it. And holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And the literal transformation says, get up and arise. Get up and arise. And she arose and walked. And he said to the disciples and to the family, go and get her something to eat. Now, if you think about it, this was the first miracle that Jesus performed where he raised someone from the dead. And people would say, well, what, why, did he, why did he tell her to go and get something to eat? Well, first off, they wanted to make sure that they understood that she was actually alive. She wasn't a ghost. This wasn't a trick. And so the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. And they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. And Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. So if you're thinking about that, you, you had this miracle performed and he raised the girl from the dead and he told her to arise and she rose up. So we look at here and we see two examples of faith that I think bears taking a closer look at. Many times you've heard these stories in Mark and yet you probably don't know the significance of these two examples of faith. The first comes from the leader of the synagogue, Jarius. He had several things that he had to have go through his mind. And, and as Max points out, there are, do you think he can? Do you think he cares? And do you think he'll actually come? Now understand that Jarius was one of the heads of the synagogue. Okay? Now, he wasn't a priest. He was just one of the heads, one of the administrators of the synagogue, the day-to-day -day activities of the synagogue. I think the truly big question is, is he who he claims? They claim he is. He'd heard of all of these people talking, just as the woman had done, about who Jesus was and about how he healed people. And they were claiming that he was indeed the son of God. So that, that question had to pop into his head. Is he who he really claims he is? You see, they have doubts and questions, not necessarily bad, but doubts all the same. From the point of Jarius, I'm sure he had heard the Pharisees and their complaining and possibly even whining about how Jesus was overshadowing and how he didn't approve of their methods, obviously. <laughs> from the things that they were doing. So I imagine there had to be apprehension in there as well. And coming and asking Jesus to come and look at his daughter to see if he could heal her. That took a leap of faith. He had to think about all of those things first. And he says, you know, will he come? Does he care? Does he care? Will he heal her? Is he who they think? See, it took that leap of faith to go to Jesus for that healing to start with. But as any parent knows, they would go to extraordinary lengths for their children. And so he did that. So as Jesus was making his way through the crowd, a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhaging for 12 years took a leap of faith and came up behind him and touched the robe of, his, of Jesus. Now what's peculiar about this is she recognized that power that Jesus had. And she felt if she could only touch him, she could be healed. She had faith of who he was and that she could be made whole by him simply from touching his garment, a robe. See, in the examples, faith overcame doubt and questions. So the healing took place. Faith overcame doubts and questions. And healing took place. 
As we go into the passage, Jesus takes note, stops, and lets her know that her faith had made her well. He wanted to acknowledge the fact that you took that leap of faith, and that faith healed you. That faith of who I was. That faith is who I am and who they said I could be. That I am indeed the Son of God. He wanted to let her know that that act of faith healed her from that disease. How many times in our lives have we let doubt stand in our way of our miracle? How many times? How many times has the healing passed us by because we had too little faith? We had too many doubts that stood in the way. We had too many questions. Instead of letting the healing happen, instead of letting our faith go, we let doubt stand in our way. When we let doubt overshadow the good that God has for us, life will pass us by. Healing will pass us by. Hope will pass us by. If you let doubt stall out your life, life will pass you by. It has no choice. Let's go on with the story. Now Jesus had just spoken to the woman when a messenger arrives to tell Jairus that his daughter had died. And see, it could have been the end of the story right there. But see, this is no ordinary story. This is no ordinary man. This is the son of the living God in their presence. Jesus just turned to Jairus and said, so don't be afraid. Have faith. Don't let fear overcome what you want to have happen. You need to have your faith stay strong. You see, faith overcomes fear in our lives. It dispels the darkness and brings that light back in. Now see, Jairus, in his humanity, could have just given up. Just gave up. I mean, after all, they told him that his daughter was already dead. And at that point, he had a choice to make. He could have let fear take over and darkness take over. But see, instead, he chose to have faith. In Jesus. Faith that Jesus could save his daughter. Faith that Jesus was who they said he was. And so he pressed on. And they pressed on to the house of Jairus. So when they came to Jairus' home, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. And he went in and said, why all this commotion? Why all the weeping? The child is dead. She's only asleep. And so what did the people do? They laughed at him. You have no clue what you're talking about, do you, buddy? You can just hear it, can't you? That's that humanist coming forward. So he made them all leave, and he took the girl's mother and father and the three disciples into the room where the girl was lying, and he reached down, and he held her hand. And he told her, he told her, Talitha Kuhn, little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. And they were overwhelmed. So let's take a look at what went on there. Point number one is validating Jesus Christ through the miracles. Jesus was who he said he was. He proved who they said he was. The raising of Jairus' daughter was Jesus first raising from the dead. Power over death pointed believers to see Jesus was the Son of God in the flesh. So it proved who he was. No more need to doubt. Here's the truth. Truth number one. Truth number two. Miracles are tied to faith. We saw two different examples of faith and the miracles that came out of that faith. See, miracles reward determined faith. Jarius risked his reputation as a religious leader because he trusted Jesus. This desperate woman 
risk public shame in touching a man because she believed he could heal her. See, she was stricken with this disease. And as I said before, that passage in Mark talks about how these people who were stricken were cast aside. They were outcasts. They were unclean. And she touched the hem of his robe and was healed. Jesus rewarded the faith of both. Miracles are tied to faith. Prayer said in sincerity. Now as we go to here, you know that, that Jairus prayed and that woman prayed silently to themselves. If only, if only he could heal. If only he could save my daughter. Prayer cannot be indifferent, can't be an indifferent ritual that we just simply go through and mouth words. Jarius was earnest in his prayer. God responds to sincere prayer, not words mouth to fulfill requirements or to impress others. In the Jewish community of the day, why, why is this so important? Because the Pharisees would stand up and they would say their prayers in public. So that everyone would understand that how great they were. But see, those were insincere words. They were requirements to fulfill the Jewish law of the time. They weren't sincere to God. They weren't seeking that relationship with God. They were seek, seeking only self-centeredness. They wanted the people, the public. To know how great they were. And God didn't respond to prayer like that. Point number four. Jesus Christ has the power to perform miracles. Now on the way to raising Jairus' daughter, Jesus healed that woman with the, hair, with the hemorrhaging. And Jesus' divine nature is seen in his ability to know that that healing power had gone out to that woman who had reached out in faith. How many times do we miss our healing because we fail to reach out in faith to God? Insincerity. Insincerity. Point number five is humanity and attitudes towards death. And we see that in the scripture when we were reading the story at the time of death. See, grief leads people to release their emotion in sobbing and in tears. And grief is natural. And it should not be denied. It is part of a healing process we might have to go through in order to move on. So that we're not stalled out in our lives and at the same time unbelief makes people ridicule the idea that death is not necessarily final and we heard that in a conversation here a week ago we were talking to a young gentleman who who you know death was final death was done and that's the end of the story but see it's not the end of the story see he had doubts that there was anything past that point if we don't have faith that Jesus is going to come home and take us home to be with him, he's already prepared a place for us. We got to raise up and claim our place. We got to say yes in faith. Faith leads people to believe the Lord of the living is also the Lord of the dead and will intervene for his own sovereign purposes. He will come back. He will take us to be home with him. And so death is not final. Death is not final. Point six. It's the revelation of the nature and character of God. Who is the author of life. God is in charge of life and death. We have to understand that. We have to believe that. We have to have faith in that. Or else we're just going through the motions. We're filling a seat. God is in charge of life and death. 
His son Jesus has the power and the authority to reverse even death. We see it several times in the scriptures. By delivering people from death, Jesus revealed the nature and the power of God. He shows the nature and power of faith in the process. How many people seeing an act like that, someone being raised from the dead, someone being healed miraculously, cannot have their faith raised up? We need to understand that. We need to witness that. We need to have faith in that. So I ask you today, where are you in your life journey? Where are you in your journey in life? The Lenten season is a time of reflection. It's a time of contemplation. And it's a time of repentance. To turn away from those things that are separating us from God. To turn away from those things that have separated us from the miracles that God wants to put in our life. To come back to that relationship with God so that we can be assured that blessed assurance that we have a future with God. That death isn't the end of the road. It's the beginning of a new journey. A new life with God. So, are you allowing doubt to stall out your life? Are your miracles passing you by? So if we listen to some, it's all nothing but smoke and mirrors. But if we study the truth, the word of God... It will show us the way to the Father. The Bible is the most read book in the history of mankind. The Bible has sold more copies than any other book in the world. There's a reason for it. It is a divine and inspired word of God. And I invite you, if you're going to give up something for Lent for 40 days, then please get into your Bible. Get into your Bible. These are the truths and the facts that you can stand on. See, all others pale in comparison. The Latin period is a time to dust off those Bibles, dispel doubt, and replace it with the truth of God's Word. Let us pray. Oh, Holy Lord, you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, to save us. And I pray today that we could all be reconciled to you. For your word tells us if anyone is in Jesus Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Lord God, I pray to live in Christ, but I am weak. I've got doubts. I've got struggles. Thank God your word says that you will give me strength in all things. So give me the strength to let go of my world and desires and instead follow where Jesus leads. Help me get back on the journey with Christ. May I be made new in Christ to be reconciled to you, Lord God, and to be forgiven of my sins through your great mercy and grace. Gracious Father, I glorify your wonderful name that there is no condemnation, that my reconciliation with you, God Almighty, is both permanent and eternal. For the wrath of God was poured out on the innocent life of Lord Jesus. Who took my place so that I could be brought back into fellowship with you. And reconciled with you, Lord God. Let us praise your wonderful name forever and ever. Amen. any doubt you shouldn't have doubt now you can let me rephrase that <laughs> didn't come out the way I wanted it to we have doubts but as Mark just taught we can have those doubts and still walk that path of Jesus we can still have that faith that he is there 
and that even though we don't know what's going to happen when we step out that door, God's got us. Kind of like the disciples, they had no idea what was going on that night that they had that final meal with Jesus. Judas knew what he was going to do. The rest of them just thought they were celebrating the Passover meal. So as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it, and then he broke it into pieces, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it, he gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Should be taken. Most gracious and loving Lord, we thank you that we have this reminder. This reminder of a couple of things, Father, because they were celebrating the Passover meal to celebrate the Passover, that when they put the blood on the door frame when you pass over their homes and gave them life. But it also reminds us of what Jesus did on the cross when his body was pierced and he died for our sins and by his blood they are passed over when it comes to eternal death. And we get to spend that with you, Father. We thank you for this constant reminder that we are your children. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we've got some prayers here <coughs> from people, and um, if there's any other prayers that you would like to ask for, yes, Lord. My coworker Dave starts his um, radiation and God, bring the Holy Spirit into this place and help me to pray for these people, Lord Jesus. Give me the words to say and the boldness to speak it, Lord. So, Father God, you bless us always, and we praise and thank you for your faithfulness, your continued protection over us, over our lives, your amazing grace that gets us through each day. Thank you, Jesus. 
Father God, even though you bless us daily, it's easy to get stuck on the on what's not going right in our lives, the whys and the trials in our lives. Gently remind us that you are always with us. You walk with us and you talk with us. You are faithful. So help us to be faithful, especially through these 40 days of Lent before Easter. Help us to trust in you and read your word so that we will draw closer to you, Jesus. That we will have that intimate relationship with you so we understand fully why you went to the cross to save us from our sins. Help us to fully know that we are saved by faith through Christ Jesus who died on the cross for us. Let us accept that free gift of your unconditional love for us. And we thank you and praise and honor you today in Jesus' name. Father God, we have people we need to pray for. We'll start with uh, Mark's family and uh, the Kent family and uh, his Uncle Bob. Lord, we just pray for healing for Bob. He's going through dialysis, Lord. We pray your loving arms around them comfort them for they've lost their son and that is a hard thing to deal with Lord Jesus and I pray that you will just be with them and guide them through this life through this times and trials that they have Lord Jesus and just help them to honor you daily and thank you for all things and then we ask for prayers for Dave for Lori's uh, work co-worker Dave for he starts his seven weeks of radiation Lord Jesus, walk with him, Jesus. Help him when he's going through this radiation to calm his heart and his body. Calm him and let him just have peace and let that healing wash over his body daily as he goes through all these trials, Lord Jesus. Help him to find you. Help him to know you are with him. And help him to know that people that loved him are praying through this. Lord God, we pray for Bill Singular. Father of Ali, a friend of Dennis's, um, who is a longtime gymnast. Um, he had back surgery to remove a mass, and the biopsy results won't be here for a week. And we pray that there is no cancer in this biopsy, Lord Jesus. We pray that the cancer is just completely diminished. There is none, and you will wash it away out of his body, Lord God. We pray that in Jesus' holy name. Lord God, we pray for Monica Burkhart. And we pray and we thank you for Monica, for she has a burden on her that we do not know, but she has a burden to pray for her friends also. I pray that you just come into her life and just heal whatever that is, Lord Jesus. And as we pray for her friends, just anoint her to... Um, walk alongside them and comfort them as they go through their trials and heal her as well, Lord God. We pray for her friend Randy in Iowa City who has an infection in his ear. We pray for Pastor Kip Morris, Morris? Morrow. Morrow. an infection in his body. And we pray for her son Matt to find a job. I also have a friend that has an infection in her body. Her name is Kim or Chris Kramer. She had surgery on her arm two weeks ago and she has an infection in her skin. Lord, I pray against these infections, Lord God. God, I pray that you um, release a healing miracle in these bodies, Lord God, that you will just wipe away these infections. Take away the swelling, take away the redness, take away all of that, Father God, and heal them completely and help them to know that this is from you. And Jesus, I pray for her son Matt to find a job that he will enjoy so he feels comforted in this time, that he will enjoy his job and that um, he will find Christian people there that will work with him and work alongside with him, Lord Jesus. I lift up my friend, my friend's niece, Marissa. We prayed for her five years ago and, and she was 21 and she had a heart transplant. And now her body is rejecting her heart. Mm -hmm. Father God, you are in control of Marissa's life. She has a five-year-old son now too, Lord God, that we place in your hands. And we place them both in your hands, Lord Jesus. 
and we ask for full healing of her body. Keep her in total peace as she trusts in you to heal her completely. Please let another miracle be done in her body, in her life, in her family's lives. Let the blood of Jesus wash over her body and heal her according to your will. Be with her son and comfort him daily as well, Lord Jesus. Father God, we lift up Keisha, her twin daughters, and her um, godson, her godchild. She is a single parent in these trying days. We ask for guidance, mercy, and healing of hearts for all of them. This family is under attack from the evil forces of this world, and I ask for a shield of protection against those voices that are speaking to their children. I ask for a revival of hearts and minds, and I ask for Christian people to be put in all their paths so that they will come alongside of them and to know that you are there with them and to know how much you love them. Help these children to not feel abandoned, but to feel the love of Keisha has for them and that you have for all of them. Please restore a renewed relationship to all of them. Be with them and comfort them in the days ahead. Give them hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, and we just thank you for Diane's surgery that went well, and we ask for healing and the power of your blood to wash over her body completely and heal and restore her hand according to your will, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and in Colossians 2, 8 through 10, See to it that no one takes you captive through the hollow and deceptive philosophies which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lies in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is head over every power and authority. And we just pray your healing over all these people, Lord Jesus. Hear our prayers for those in need. Hear our prayers for those who are sick and who are lost. And bring them back to you. In Jesus' name we pray for this. Amen. Thank you for that, Denise. And uh, what I was hearing in that verse of Colossians is, Forget the doubts of the world and trust in Jesus, yes. and you will be healed. Yes. Uh, it's amazing how how we align ourselves <laughs> in our messages. But I, in, in talking about that, um, you know, and I know that she won't want me to bring this up. She never likes paying attention to herself. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori had some abnormal tests come through, oh. and <laughs> she went to see the doctor. Has to keep it clean. Amen. Yep. Oh, so our so prayers God. worked. Yes. As we come to this closing time in our online portion of our service today, um, we just want to thank God for being here with us in this very room. <coughs> and so we'll go to God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and the power in your name. Thank you that you hold the keys over death and that by your might, Jesus was raised for the grave, paving that way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you have a plan for us and that you made a way for us to join you in eternity. We confess today our need for you to refresh us and to make us new again. We ask you to renew our hearts, our minds, and our lives for the days ahead. We pray for your mighty power to search over this land for your love, which is big enough to surround the entire world. Lord, let your love work in the hearts of all people. Lord, we, we thank you and praise you that we're given this day, these 40 days to keep focused on your word to focus on what is pure, what is right. Give us the power to be obedient to your word. And Lord, we ask for you to keep us safe from the attacks of this world. Keep us safe with you and that your purchase of purposes and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you would be our defense and our 
guard keeping our way clear, removing the obstacles from our path and covering the pitfalls with your love, Lord. Lead us onto your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us, over us, to be a light unto the entire world, to dispel the doubt, to dispel the, the anger, the darkness that exists in this world today. May we make a difference in this world for your glory, for your purpose. Set your way before us, and may all your plans succeed. May we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and your healing. Thanks be to you, God, for your indescribable gift of life through Christ Jesus. To you be all glory and honor on this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name.